So having seen how views about marriage and sexual complementarity are so deeply embedded in so many faith traditions, uh, the major world religions, I think that helps us to understand better the potential threats to religious freedom that occur when legislation may prevent uh, living out or passing on those values. And so to, to speak to us about some of those very real threats today, um, we have with us Professor Robert George, who is the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions here at Princeton University. He has also taught at Harvard Law School. He is Chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom and has served on the President's Council on Bioethics and as a presidential appointee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. He was a Judicial Fellow at the Supreme Court of the United States, where he received the Justice Tom C. Clark Award. A Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Swarthmore College, he holds degrees in law and theology from Harvard and a doctorate in philosophy of law from Oxford University, in addition to many honorary degrees. He is a recipient of the U.S. Presidential Citizens Medal and the Honorific Medal for the Defense of Human Rights of the Republic of Poland, and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So I'm delighted to introduce you to uh, Professor Robert George, who's going to speak about faith, sex, and freedom, what people of faith can expect in a revisionist marriage culture. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you very much, Melissa. Thank you. Well, it's wonderful to be here, and thanks to all of you for being here. It's a special uh, pleasure for me to be introduced by uh, Melissa, who was my graduate student not very long ago here. And she's uh, gone on now to do such wonderful things, and I'm very, very uh, proud of her. Uh, I'm also very proud of Cassie and Caitlin and Brittany and the entire team at the Love and Fidelity uh, Network. It's hard for me to think of work being done anywhere uh, on any topic as important as the work being done uh, by uh, these women and by all of you who are part of the Love and Fidelity uh, family. Just can't stress enough uh, the importance and significance of uh, what you're doing. And I'm mainly here to just offer a word of encouragement to you. I, I uh, will uh, have to uh, uh, perhaps place some of that encouragement at risk just by talking a bit about how bad the threats are out there. Uh, but my fundamental uh, intention is to deliver a very, very positive uh, mes message. Uh, not because I think uh, it's good to whistle past the graveyard, but because I think all things considered, the positive message is the correct one. Well, it was only yesterday, was it not, that we were being assured and reassured and re-reassured that the definition of marriage to include same-sex partnerships would have no impact on persons or institutions that hold to traditional ideas of marriage, the idea of marriage as a conjugal partnership. Such persons and institutions would, we were told, simply be untouched by the change. It won't affect your marriage or your life or anything important to you, we were told, if the law recognizes Henry and Herman, or Sally and Sheila, as married. It's all just a matter of live and let live. That was the message when the case was being made and the movement was being built. Those offering us these assurances were also claiming that the redefinition of marriage would have no impact on the public understanding of marriage as a monogamous, and sexually exclusive partnership. No one, they insisted, wanted to alter those traditional norms. On the contrary, the redefinition of marriage, we were told, would promote and spread those norms more broadly. This was the fundamental point of Andrew Sullivan's inaugural book, the book inaugurating the movement, virtually normal, back in the early 1990s. The goal, Sullivan assured us, is by no means to alter the public understanding of marriage and its uh, norms and requirements, but only to spread them more broadly, including to populations of people 
where those norms are not generally respected. No one was seeking to redefine marriage. Sometimes we were told quite in a spirit of some irritation that claiming that people wanted to redefine marriage just amounted to scare tactics. Nobody wanted to redefine marriage. The goal was merely to broaden the pool of people eligible to participate in the institution. When some of us warned that all of this was nonsense and pointed out the myriad ways that Catholics, Evangelicals, Mormons, Eastern Orthodox Christians, Orthodox Jews, Muslims, and others would be affected and their opportunities and liberties restricted by the legal recognition of same-sex partnerships and relatedly by the insertion of the concept of sexual orientation into anti-discrimination statutes and ordinances. Our liberal friends accused us of scaremongering when we observed that reducing marriage to a form of sexual romantic companionship or domestic partnership, which is what happens when sexual reproductive complementarity is banished from the definition of marriage, removes any principled ground, any ground of rational principle for understanding marriage as a sexually exclusive and faithful union of two persons and not an open partnership or a relationship of three or more persons in a polyamorous sexual ensemble. We were charged with invalid slippery slope reasoning. Remember? No one, they assured us, would require, say, Christian foster care and adoption services to place children in same-sex headed households. This was back in the early or mid 19. 90s. No one, they said, would require religiously affiliated schools and social service agencies to treat same-sex partners as spouses or impose penalties or disabilities on those that dissent. It was going to be live and let live. No one would be fired from his or her job or suffer employment discrimination for voicing support for conjugal marriage or criticizing same-sex sexual conduct and relationships or opposing the redefinition of marriage. No business owner, we were told, would be required to provide services for same-sex ceremonies if they were contrary to the owner's moral beliefs or religious beliefs. And no one would be punished for declining to provide them. And no one was proposing to recognize polyamorous relationships or normalize open marriages, nor would redefinition undermine the norms of sexual exclusivity and monogamy in theory or in practice. That was then. This is now. I must say, though, that I still can't fathom why anybody believed any of it, even then. The whole argument was and is that the idea of marriage is the union of husband and wife. The idea of marriage is a conjugal partnership and not merely sexual romantic companionship or domestic partnership lacks a rational basis and amounts to nothing more than bigotry. The bigotry charge was flogged relentlessly. Therefore, no reasonable person of good will can dissent from the liberal position on sex and marriage any more than a reasonable person of good will could support racial segregation and subordination. The analogy, the parallel between supporting marriage as a conjugal union and being in favor of racially discriminatory, racially discriminatory laws such as laws forbidding interracial marriage was pushed, asserted, time and time and time again. The whole point was, if you believe in marriage as a conjugal union, if you believe that marriage is what people have always thought marriage was, you are just like a racist. 
you have no more ground for your belief than someone has a ground for the belief that blacks ought not to be able to marry whites. You must be driven by something like the same animus, to use Justice Kennedy's favored term, that drove the bigots in the Jim Crow South. If you dissent, you are a very bad person. Fabulous intimidation tactics. Got to hand it to him. Very shrewd. And not all that difficult to carry out if you control the main institutions of the communication and dissemination of culture. The journalistic establishment, the professoriate, the professional associations, and so forth. And this, because marriage, according to the redefiners, consists principally of companionship of people committed to mutual affection and care. That's what marriage actually is, they say. So any distinctions beyond this must be condemned as baseless. And if baseless, how could you hold them? Perhaps on the basis of a kind of sheer blind religious faith, but then where did the sheer blind religious faith come up with them? The bigotry's got to be down in there somewhere. Now, since most liberals and even some conservatives these days, it seems, apparently have no understanding at all of the idea of marriage as a conjugal relationship, a one flesh union, as Rabbi Berkison put it uh, in the clip we had of him, obviously quoting from uh, Genesis 2. Not even enough understanding uh, or grasp of it consciously to consider it and reject it, they uncritically conceive marriage precisely as sexual romantic companionship and domestic partnership, and therefore they really can't fathom how anyone could possibly understand it in any other way. This despite the fact that the idea of marriage precisely as a conjugal partnership, marriage as conjugal, has historically been embodied in our matrimonial laws and explains their content, not just the requirement of spousal sexual complementarity, but also norms concerning legal consummation and annullability, norms of monogamy and sexual exclusivity, and the pledge of permanence of commitment. It's the conjugal understanding of marriage that explains all of that, why it's two persons and not three or four or five or more in a polyamorous relationship, why it's sexually closed, requiring fidelity and exclusivity rather than open marriages, why it's a pledge of permanence till death do we part and not a temporary relationship, a pledge to stay together for five years renewable or for as long as love lasts. Those norms cannot be explained as having any principled basis on the sexual romantic companionship or domestic partnership view or definition of marriage. Still, having adopted the sexual romantic domestic partnership idea and seeing no alternative possible conception of marriage, they assume, and it's just that, it's an assumption and a gratuitous one at that, that no actual reason exists for regarding sexual reproductive complementarity as integral to marriage. After all, two men or two women can have a romantic interest in each other, live together in a sexual partnership, care for each other, and so on. So why can't they be married? If you think they can't, there's something wrong with you. Because to think Otherwise, is to have no rational basis for your view. It's to discriminate invidiously. Now, of course, by the same token, if two men or two women can be married, why can't three or more people, irrespective of sex, in a polyamorous triad or quadrat? Triads, I'm, I'm now told, have an official name, thruples. Perhaps you read about the, the Massachusetts uh, thruple, a three-woman uh, uh, thruple uh, with um, 
they're intending to have three kids. They've already got one. Uh, and they make exactly the arguments that have been made to redefine marriage since the early uh, 1990s. And the arguments work like a charm. And they work just as well uh, as they did uh, uh, for redefining marriage as a same-sex partnership if you assume the premise that what marriage is is sexual romantic companionship or domestic partnership. Since no reason supports the idea of, male, of marriage as a male-female union, according to this view, or a partnership of two persons and not three or more, the motive of those insisting on these traditional norms, the pejoratively described Aussie and Harriet view of marriage, must also be a dark and irrational one. Now, my point that redefining marriage as sexual romantic companionship or domestic partnership to accommodate same-sex relationships erodes the basis of permanence and exclusivity in any relationship is increasingly confirmed by the rhetoric and arguments of advocates of this view themselves and by the policies that they are increasingly led to embrace. University of Arizona philosophy professor Elizabeth Brake, for example, supports what she calls minimal marriage in which, I quote her, individuals can have legal marital relationships with more than one person, reciprocally or asymmetrically, themselves determining the sex and number of the parties, the type of relationship with, uh, involved, and which rights and responsibilities to exchange with each, unquote. That is not some crazy fringe position. The article from which I quoted was published in the leading journal of moral and political philosophy in the English-speaking world, the journal known as Ethics, published from the University of Chicago. You don't get more mainstream in the academic world than ethics. And there it is. Judith Stacy, a prominent New York University professor, NYU professor, who is, in, again, in no way regarded as a fringe figure, in testifying before Congress against the Defense of Marriage Act. So how unfringy Professor Stacy is, is evident from the fact that she's one of the people that the opponents of the Defense of Marriage Act put up to testify in front of Congress when they were opposing the act. She expressed hope that the redefinition of marriage would give marriage, quote, varied, creative, and adaptive contours, leading some to question the dyadic limitations of Western marriage and seek small group marriages. To translate out of the academic ease, dyadic means two. The idea of marriage as a two-person union. This highly respected professor testifying on behalf of the opponents of the Defense of Marriage Act goes before Congress and says, Part of the reason we should oppose the Defense of Marriage Act and we should favor the redefinition of marriage to accommodate same-sex partnerships is that the principle of the thing undermines this bad idea of marriage as dyadic, involving only two people, as opposed to what we should be open to seeking, for example, small group marriages. In their statement entitled Beyond Same-Sex Marriage, more than 300 self-described LGBT and allied scholars and advocates, including such prominent and influential figures as Gloria Steinem, Barbara Ehrenreich, and Kenji Yoshino, call for legally recognizing as marriages or the equivalent sexual relationships involving more than two partners. Nor are such relationships unheard of. Newsweek reports that there are more than 500,000 polyamorous households in the United States alone. In Brazil, a public notary has recognized a trio of people, a throuple, as a civil union. Mexico City has considered expressly temporary marriage licenses for terms of years. The Toronto District School Board treats polyamorous sexual partnerships as among the many valid forms of family structure in its curricular materials. And what about the connection to family life? Well, Writer E.J. Graff celebrates the fact that recognizing same-sex unions would change the, quote, institution's message, unquote, so that it would, quote, ever after stand for sexual choice for cutting the link between sex and diapers. Enacting same-sex marriage, she says, does more than just fit. 
it announces that marriage has changed shape. So she is now perfectly willing to say what had to be suppressed 20 years ago. And that is, yes, it's not that we're just trying to open up the institution of marriage so that more people are eligible to participate in it. No, we're going, we're, the whole point is to change the shape of marriage, to redefine marriage. What about sexual exclusivity? Well, Andrew Sullivan himself, that self-styled proponent of the, quote, conservative, unquote, case for same-sex marriage, has gone so far as to extol his words, the spirituality of anonymous sex. Well, I'm such uh, uh, a dinosaur that uh, I had to actually um, go to Google, which despite being a, a dinosaur, I actually know how to use, um, to, to find out what anonymous sex is. And that means sex between people who don't even bother to uh, reveal their names uh, to each other. So uh, this, according to Sullivan, uh, has a uh, spirituality. And he welcomes the fact that the openness to same-sex unions might erode sexual exclusivity among those in opposite-sex marriages. So much for the conservative case, uh, spreading the norms of monogamy and exclusivity uh, into cultures, subcultures that uh, uh, don't have them. Uh, now that uh, the cause seems to be won, even people like Sullivan, who proclaimed themselves conservatives uh, at the beginning, are willing to say what they really think. Similarly, in a New York Times Magazine profile, same-sex marriage activist and sex columnist Dan Savage encourages spouses to adopt, quote, a more flexible attitude, quote, about sex, unquote, about sex outside their marriage. A piece in The Advocate, a gay interest news magazine, supports the point still more candidly. Here's what they say in their editorial. Anti-equality right-wingers, I think they have in mind people like me, <laughs> have long insisted that allowing gays to marry will destroy the sanctity of traditional marriage, and of course the logical liberal party line response has long been, no, it won't. But what if, for once, the sanctimonious crazies, I, I think they meant you, Bill Hurl, at that time, <laughs> are right. Could the gay male tradition of open relationships actually alter marriage as we know it? And would that be such a bad thing, unquote. Other advocates of redefining marriage have also embraced the goal of weakening marriage in these very terms, weakening marriage. Victoria, writer Victoria Brownworth says, former President George W. Bush is correct when he states that allowing same-sex couples to marry will weaken the institution of marriage it most certainly will do so. And that will make marriage a far better concept than it previously has been. Michelangelo Signorelli, another prominent advocate of redefining marriage, urges people in same-sex same relationships to, quote, demand the right to marry, not as a way of adhering to society's moral codes, but rather to debunk a myth and radically alter an archaic institution, unquote. They should, quote, fight for same-sex marriage and its benefits, and then, once granted, redefine the institution of marriage completely because the most subversive action lesbian and gay men, lesbians and gay men can undertake is to transform the notion of family entirely, unquote. So you see many advocates of redefinition, sensing that they have now won and it's just a mopping up operation, and believing that there is no turning back. After all, you know, if you're a progressive, you believe the future has a direction uh, and uh, you're on the right side of history because history has a side and uh, everything that's not on the right side of history is just going to be uh, left in the, in the dirt. So now, believing they've won, there's no turning back and this is permanent and forever, they're increasingly open in saying that they do not see these disputes about sex and marriage as honest disagreements among reasonable people of goodwill. They are rather battles between the forces of reason, enlightenment, and equality. Those who would expand the circle of inclusion, as they say, on one side, and those of ignorance, bigotry, and discrimination on the other. Those who would exclude people out of hatred 
or animus. The excluders then are to be treated just as racists are treated since they are the equivalent of racists. Of course, we in the United States at least don't put racists in jail for expressing their opinions. We respect our First Amendment. But we don't hesitate to stigmatize them and impose various forms of social and even civil disability on them and their institutions. In the name of what it pleases uh, the media these days to call marriage equality and the media being true to its longstanding tradition of nonpartisanship and objectivity. <laughs> liberty, especially religious liberty and the liberty of conscience and genuine equality in pluralism are undermined. Now, as I've said so often in the past, the fundamental error made by some supporters of conjugal marriage was and is, I believe, to imagine that a grand bargain could be struck with their opponents. A bargain that would have read something like, we will accept the legal redefinition of marriage, you will respect our right to act on our consciences without penalty, discrimination, or civil disabilities of any type. Same-sex partners will get marriage licenses, but no one will be forced uh, for any reason to recognize those marriages or suffer discrimination or disabilities in employment, licensing, accreditation, government contracting, or any other area for declining to recognize them or become complicit in facilitating them. There was never any hope of such a bargain being accepted. It was a bad deal because an insincere offer, for the most part, not in every case, but in the most part, when it was salient, when it was relevant in legislative debates and in referendum uh, uh, discussions during the period prior to the court's intervention uh, in the debate. Perhaps parts of such a bargain would be accepted by liberal forces temporarily for strategic or tactical reasons in order to push same-sex marriage through. But guarantees of religious liberty and non-discrimination for people who cannot in conscience accept same-sex marriage could then be eroded and eventually removed. After all, full equality, as they call it, requires that no quarter be given to bigots. And when you framed your whole argument, when you've used the bigot card, when, you, when your whole case is built on those intimidation tactics, you're in. You're locked in. So what are you going to do with these bigots now? You've labeled them bigots. You can't give them any quarter. To do that is to compromise on full equality. Why let them engage in discrimination? Even in the name of their retrograde religious beliefs, Dignitarian harm, as they call it, must be opposed as resolutely as more palpable forms of harm. And so that's why they claim we've got to force the wedding cake bakers to bake cakes for same-sex ceremonies, the florist to provide flower arrangements for same-sex ceremonies, the photographer to contribute his artistic skills, the printer is printing to same-sex ceremonies, whether they in conscience are able to do that or not. If you respect their consciences, the consciences of these bigots, you will be permitting them to impose dignitarian harm on the poor victims. Now there's a reason for this. Liberal secularism never was and never will be what the late John Rawls, the great Harvard political philosopher, depicted it as being and hoped, sincerely hoped it would be, namely a purely political doctrine as opposed to what he called a comprehensive view, a view of human nature, meaning, dignity, and destiny that competes with other comprehensive views. In other words, neutrality is impossible. Nowhere is the reality of contemporary liberalism as a comprehensive doctrine and not a neutral one or a purely political one. 
a secularist religion, more plainly on display than in the moral cultural struggle over sexuality and marriage. Liberal secularism will tolerate other comprehensive views so long as they present no real challenge or serious threat to its most cherished values. But when they do, then they must be smashed in the name, for example, of equality or preventing dignitarian harm. And their faithful must be reduced to demi-like status in respect of opportunities in employment, contracting, and other areas that, from the point of view of liberal secularist doc doctrine, cannot be made available to them if they refuse to conform themselves to the demands of liberal ideology. About all that, you can simply direct your inquiry to Brendan Eich, the high-tech genius who was forced out of his leadership position at Mozilla for having made a contribution to the Proposition 8 campaign in California. Now, of course, there will be some within the liberal community, Rawlsians and others, people who deserve great respect and admiration, who will try to make some room for meaningful dissent, even in practice and not just in thought and speech. There are old-fashioned liberals there, out there, who stand for traditional principles of pluralism and freedom, freedom of thought and expression. And they will make various arguments, principled and practical, for why what might be described as the church of liberal secularism should avoid being too draconian in its treatment of heretics and dissenters. But they will lose the battle. The very success of the movement to which they have given their allegiance will reinforce the belief among their compatriots that the movement's victories were victories of righteousness over evildoers. And expressions of dissent, even small ones, will increasingly be perceived not only as deeply wicked, but as presenting a grave and intolerable danger to the order of goodness that was, after a long struggle and at great cost, finally achieved. And so, as Dean Robert Vischer of the University of St. Thomas Law School has observed, the tension between religious liberty and gay rights is a thorny problem that will continue to crop up, he says, in our policy debates for the foreseeable future. Dismissing religious liberty concerns as the progeny of a separate but equal mindset, Vischer says, does not bode well for the future of those debates. That, in my opinion, is to put it mildly, doesn't bode well. But there is, in my opinion, no chance, no chance of persuading the majority of champions of sexual liberation. It should be clear uh, that that, in fact, is the cause that they serve. Melissa's use of that language is entirely on point. That they should respect or permit the law to respect the conscience rights of those with whom they disagree. Look at it from their point of view. Why should we permit full equality to be trumped by bigotry? Why should we recognize a right to discriminate? Why should we respect religions and religious institutions that are, as they say, incubators of homophobia? Bigotry, religiously based or not, must be eradicated. The law should certainly not give it recognition or lend it any standing or dignity. Why should those who hold bigoted views be permitted to hold faculty positions at colleges, universities, or in law schools? Why should they even be permitted to speak or be heard on campuses? Why should they be tolerated in print or in broadcast media, whether news or entertainment, or in law firms, or in the corporate world? Of course, people who hold conservative views on moral issues have long experienced discrimination in all of these areas. But until recently, the discriminators felt it necessary to pretend that they did not practice discrimination. Why are there so few or no moral conservatives on your faculty, you might say to some university professor? Oh, he might reply, it must be because they aren't bright enough or accomplished enough. Or, this is a good one, I like this one, 
Well, conservatives love money more than ideas, so they gravitate toward business, not academic life. That's why there's so few conservatives. <laughs> or, gosh, I don't know. It's just a mystery. Why are there so few people in Hollywood who hold or reveal that they hold conservative views on moral questions? Oh, well, I guess that's just another one of those impenetrable mysteries. Really just beats me. I mean, it's not as if there's a blacklist or anything. But increasingly, it will be unnecessary to dissemble or maintain these pretenses. The answer will simply be, we do not tolerate your kind around here. We do not tolerate bigots in this town or college or law firm. The lesson, it seems to me, for those of us who believe that the conjugal conception of marriage is true and good and who wish to protect the rights of our faithful and our institutions to honor that belief in carrying out their vocations and missions is that there is no alternative to winning the battle in the public square over the legal definition of marriage, however dark and even hopeless the cause looks to us now, and even if the time horizon we must adopt is 50 or 100 years. The grand bargain is an illusion, and we must dismiss it from our minds. And even if we don't, it will soon be blasted out of our minds by the harsh realities that will descend upon dissenters from the new liberal orthodoxy. There will be more Brendan Ikes, more people who are made examples of so that others, especially young people like yourselves, fearful of the consequences for their livelihoods and relationships, won't even consider expressing dissent. If you yield to that, you have accepted dimitude, not from your Muslim neighbors. Your Muslim fellow citizens have no interest in reducing you to that state. It's not there that the threat comes from, of something like dimitude. It's from secular liberalism. It's where Brendan Eich suffered. Indeed, the ultimate goal of punishing the public dissenters is to marginalize and stigmatize dissent itself to the point that people will be deterred not only from expressing it, but even from entertaining it in the privacy of their own minds. The goal is a kind of controlling of thought, not just a limitation of speech. Of course, with sexual liberalism now so powerfully entrenched in the established institutions of the elite sector of our culture and fully embraced, of course, by the President of the United States and the Democratic Party and funded by innumerable hedge fund billionaires and corporate titans, some view the defense of marriage as a lost cause. Some have just given up. That's particularly true in wake of the recent shameful decision of the Supreme Court to let the lower federal courts impose same-sex marriage on vast parts of the country without the justices taking any responsibility for the preposterous claim that Americans actually redefined marriage in 1868 when they ratified the 14th Amendment without so much as the slightest awareness that they were doing or even might be doing any such thing. Anyway, I think that defeatism, though understandable in our current grim condition, is another mistake, one that sexual liberals have every reason to encourage their opponents to make and ample resources to promote. We've all heard the argument, really it's not an argument, the taunt. Quote, the acceptance of same-sex marriage on a national scale is inevitable. It's a done deal. You had better get on the right side of history, lest you be remembered in the company of Orville Faubus and George Wallace and the other uh, racists of the old Jim Crow South. I want to remind you, though, that this is exactly what we were told, those of us of a certain age will remember this, it's exactly what we were told about the so-called woman's right to abortion in the mid-1970s. 
and many demoralized pro-life people, Bill and Ricky will remember this, believed it. It looked to them the way the marriage situation looks to you or to us now. But of course, it didn't turn out that way. A greater percentage of Americans are pro-life today than in the 1970s. And young people are more pro-life than people of their parents' generation. And the pro-life torch has been kept alive. And incremental legislation has been passed. And Roe versus Wade is still just one vote away from being reversed. And if a Republican is elected in, 19, in 2016, it could very well be reversed. The idea promoted by the abortion lobby in those days, when their cause seemed to be a juggernaut, the way same-sex marriage is today, that, quote, the American, the American people will inevitably accept abortion as a matter of women's rights and social hygiene, proved spectacularly false. The, the, the January 23rd, 1973, the morning after, the day after Roe versus Wade was handed down, the New York Times headline story uh, said the Supreme Court abor uh, uh, settles abortion issue. Well, what's the most unsettled issue in American politics? What, on what do elections still turn to this very day? Abortion. The partisans of abortion in those days thought that it was done. And it looked that way. And as I say, even some pro-life people believe that. I mean, the American people now have bought into what they're going to accept. Just a few old priests, you know, standing back from accepting it. And they're going to die out pretty soon. All the young people are for it. You know, it's a generational thing. Once the older generation goes, abortion will just be integrated into America. It won't even be an issue. Five years from now, this is 1974, 75, 76. Five years from now, most 10 years from now, it just won't even be, it won't be anything anybody thinks about. It would be like, you know, having uh, uh, kidney operations or, you know, appendectomies. And, of course, that did turn out to be spectacularly false. Now, a moment ago, I, I uh, recalled that the case was made both for women's rights and social hygiene. Too many undesirables being born. That was one of the elements of the case for abortion. It's embarrassing for people today to, um, on the pro-abortion side to uh, recall that. But it was quite a prominent part uh, of uh, the case that was made in those days. Uh, unfortunately for the, uh, the pro-choice people, uh, Ju uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg keeps reminding uh, people, uh, inadvertently, I think, reminding people of this. But speaking of social hygiene, let's think back even farther to another experience in American history with a great social issue and an apparent juggernaut that was supposed to be unstoppable. Back in the 1920s and 30s, eugenics was embraced by the elite institutions of American society from the wealthy philanthropic foundations to the mainline Protestant denominations to the Supreme Court of the United States. My friend Russ Neely down here will recall the famous statement by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, a, you know, a textbook progressive in the Buck versus Bell case involving the mandatory sterilization of a woman who was alleged, it turns out incorrectly, to be mentally defective. Holmes said, three, in upholding the mandatory sterilization, three generations of imbeciles are enough. And, and there was no controversy about that. It wasn't considered a faux pas in those days because this eugenics idea was riding high. It was a juggernaut. There again, it was you know, the Catholics and a few you know, you know, hillbilly, they didn't use the word evangelical, fundamentalists holding back. But you know, all the right-thinking people, the smart people, the people in the universities, the elite, the wealthy people, the affluent people, the foundations, the professional associations were all behind the eugenics idea, all on board. So it too seemed like a juggernaut. And it seemed that the back of any resistance that was left among these handful of Catholics and other religious people would be broken and broken by the sheer rationality of the eugenics idea after all. I mean, what possible reason could there be for not wanting smarter, healthier, prettier, better people to be born? What is there not to like about that? It's just irrational. 
to oppose doing things that could make a better gene pool with better people. The eugenicists were certain that their adversaries were, you guessed it, on the wrong side of history. The full acceptance of eugenics, they believed, was inevitable, another progressive idea. But of course, things didn't quite turn out that way, although unfortunately, eugenics is coming in now back as a kind of backdoor thing. But to this day, the eugenics movement is a blot and an embarrassment on the progressive record. Now note that my point here is not to say or imply that redefining marriage is morally just like abortion or eugenics. There are obvious and important differences. My point is about the claim made by pro progressives and some others in each case that the triumph of the cause was inevitable and that those who declined to go along were against progress and had placed themselves on the wrong side of history. So does that mean that the reverse is true, that the conjugal conception of marriage and the understanding of sexual morality and integrity of which it's a part will eventually prevail in law and culture? No. There is nothing inevitable in this domain. As the left-wing but anti-Hegelian Brazilian legal theorist Roberto Unger used to preach to those of us in his classes uh, at the Harvard Law School, the future will be the fruit of human deliberation, judgment, and choice in circumstances of contingency. It is not subject to fixed laws of history and forces of social determinism. As the Marxists learned the hard way, the reality of human freedom is the permanent foiler of, inele of inevitability theses. Same-sex marriage and the assaults on liberty and equality that follow in its wake are inevitable only if defenders of marriage make their adversaries' prophecies self-fulfilling ones by buying into them themselves. So my call to supporters of marriage and religious liberty is to stand up, speak out, fight back, resist. Do not be demoralized. Refuse to be intimidated. Refuse to yield your own integrity by acquiescing or going silent. Speak moral truth to cultural, political, and economic power. Openly love what is good and defy and resist whatever opposes and threatens it. Be prepared if it comes to it to pay the cost of discipleship. Stand together with anyone of any faith, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, Jewish, Mormon, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, Sikh, Jain, or those without any particular faith, but who believe in what's morally right. Stand with anyone who will stand with you to uphold marriage and defend freedom. Be gentle as doves, to be sure, but cunning as serpents. Be relentless in your determination to defend what is right in the courts and in the streets, on the blogs and in the legislative chambers. For those of you who are people of faith, pray ceaselessly. To all of you, work to elect champions of life, marriage, and religious liberty. Fight to keep the Republican Party faithful to the moral principles that have drawn so many former Democrats, such as myself, into it over the past three decades. Remember that those on the other side of the issue, having now won a complete lock on the Democratic Party, it is, for all intents and purposes, impossible to have any kind of political success in the Democratic Party while dissenting on the marriage question, will now devote their attention and formidable resources to making inroads among Republicans. That was a major uh, reality in this election that we had uh, earlier this week. Uh, it was not successful, but they will be back uh, time and time again. 
we must defeat those efforts, making clear to the Republican establishment that those of us who are in the party or who have joined the party are loyal to the party on the condition that the party is faithful to its principles. Let us remind the Republicans that their party was founded as a party of moral conviction, pledged to fight the twin relics of barbarism, to use the phrase from the 1856 Republican platform, the first Republican platform, slavery and polygamy. Standing for what is right and against what is wrong is in the GOP's DNA. Slavery was wicked because it denied the basic humanity and dignity of an entire class of human beings, just as the abortion license does today. Polygamy was unacceptable because it undermined the principle of marriage as a truly conjugal relationship, a permanent and exclusive one flesh union of husband and wife. But you see, these relics have not disappeared. They've simply taken on new forms. And we must stand against them today with Lincolnian conviction and determination to prevail, no matter the cost, no matter how long it takes. It will not be easy. I'm not here to tell you it's going to be easy or cost free or that no one will have to sacrifice. It will not be easy. And to worldly eyes, the horizon looks bleak. But mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Thank you. Yeah, I can do that. Thank you. Thank you Mark. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks. M M uh, Melissa uh, has asked me to, to take a few questions, and I'd be, uh, be happy to do that. Tell me uh, your name and, and which uh, college or university you're from. D down, I think there's someone down here in the front. Hi, I'm Carlos. I'm from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Yeah. I want to ask you, what uh, do you recommend to business owners who have been challenged by the government to uh, provide their services to same-sex weddings? If you can call them that, well, you can't. Yeah. But um, would you uh, recommend that they just, uh, you know, disobey explicitly, say, you know, come arrest me, I will burn the fines, you know, what do you suggest that they do? Yeah, it's a question of conscience, and uh, I think, you know, different... Uh, business owners will have to deal with it differently in light of their own conscientious beliefs. For those who believe that they cannot in conscience under any circumstances, including the compulsion of law, comply with participation, say for example, by contributing their artistic talents as photographers to a same-sex uh, ceremony, uh, then I think they have no choice but to defy the law and accept the consequences or to go out of business or to restructure their business in such a way as to enable them to uh, uh, escape the uh, legal liability, perhaps by not doing weddings of any, of any type. They, they'll photograph other sorts of things, but, but not weddings. Uh, there will be others who will have a different reading in conscience. They, they will feel that, uh, believe as a matter of conscience, that, uh, that they must try to resist. But if at the end of the day they are under the force of law, they can cooperate. They can, they can go along with it, sort of under under protest, and, and that will be what will uh, be suitable for them. It really is a question of the, of the conscience of the, uh, of the individual. I would urge all of these persons and institutions, though, including educational institutions, Catholic, Orthodox, Jewish, Evangelical, Protestant, all these different, uh, the, the Muslim College, Zaytuna, in, uh, in Ber uh, Berkeley, California, Oakland, California, which is gonna face this issue. I would urge all of them to avail themselves of the resources of the public interest law firms, such as the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, the American uh, Center for Law and Justice, the ADF, the Alliance Defending Freedom, avail themselves of the opportunities and the resources of those uh, entities 
to protect their institutions and their faculties and their students and the people who own the business to the extent that they, uh, that they can. I think it's very important to fight as hard as possible. Also, they should be the core of the lobby at both the state and federal level for legislation to protect people against the use of anti-discrimination laws as a weapon to whip people into, uh, into line, into conformity uh, with, uh, with the new agenda. There is legislation uh, that's already been introduced uh, in the Congress that is being introduced out there in the states. It should be introduced in, uh, in every state and, uh, and, and fought for to protect those rights. I, I think it's also important that the, the, the distinctions be drawn. There's a I mean, the, it, take the famous florist case. What the florist objected to was providing the flowers or arranging the flowers for the ceremony. The individual two people who were going to be married, if you believe that's marriage, were being sold flowers for other things by the same shop for many years. The, the objection was not to selling these people flowers because we don't agree with the way they lead their lives. The question was, can I in conscience participate in a ceremony, facilitate the ceremony? And I think keeping that distinction in mind is important. By obliterating or obscuring that distinction, uh, the left in the famous Arizona uh, case was able to persuade people that what these business owners were trying to do was to have a, a kind of a free license to discriminate against people they didn't like. And that, that was not true. But when you got the media on your side, you can tell the story however you want to, uh, you want to tell it. And it looked like they were you know, not selling people a flower if they came into the flower shop or selling people a muffin if they came into the deli. Was there, uh, Ryan, I think your hand was up. Uh, Ryan from the University of Michigan. Uh, my question is, well, you've made the point about uh, being as innocent as does in terms of witnessing to what marriage is at college. What would you recommend as a principle of application for prudential concerns in terms of how, how I should witness in one situation rather than another in terms of this is clearly what marriage is. This is how I say it this way. This is what line of argument I give here. This is where I refrain from speaking on the issue in terms of those prudential issues. I was wondering if you have any. I, I'm having trouble hearing you, Ryan, I'm, oh. even though we're right on top oh. of each other. So to, to lay that aside, they heard you. Tell me. Yeah. Um, uh, do you have any uh, advice on prudential judgments of witnessing to marriage in co at college? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Be, be sensible about it. I mean, don't, don't go quiet. If you're not speaking because you're intimidated, then you're making a mistake. If you're not speaking because, you know, it's three in the morning, or you're not speaking because we're talking about the football game, you know, or we're not speaking because, you know, look, in these circumstances, I don't want to get it. This is just not the place to have a big, you know, uh, conflagration. Then, then that's, that's fine. I, th I think the test is, are you ever speaking? If you're never speaking, then you have to be asking yourself, why am I not speaking? I'm speaking about other things. Why am I not speaking on this? Why am I refusing to bear witness on this? It's probably a, a, not, a, a not honorable reason uh, uh, for that. Now, the other side of that, Ryan, is you need, and I think this is part of the responsibility, we need to equip ourselves to be able to speak. And our speaking can't just be lecturing people. It's got to be true dialogical engagement. It's got to be listening in an open-minded way, considering the possibility that I may be wrong, listening to what the person on the other side has to say, but being equipped to answer the arguments, being equipped, being informed, being well-read, studying the issue so that you're prepared to make the, the best case. Uh, and my own experience is that people respect that. So that's, that's my advice. I mean, it's, 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 it's not merely prudential. I mean, I think the obligation, especially when you're in college, to be open-minded, to engage people on the other side, open to the possibility of correction, open to the possibility you might be wrong. That's just, a, that's just an obligation we have as human beings, especially in the context of education. I, I do think the other side should do that, too. 
There's a question up there. You know, after this 18-year-old was elected to the state legislature in West Virginia, I look out at all you guys and I see, gosh, you could all be senators and congressmen. <laughs> Um, Kelly, Tom uh, Kelly Thomas from Georgetown University. Um, during your talk, you, as Abley pointed out, um, kind of how one side has pointed uh, the more conservative side as being bigots, and that has yeah. put a stop to a lot of discourse. And I think many of us have seen that on college campuses, um, kind of uh, defeating the purpose of a university in that sense. I was wondering if, um, you know, in your past experience, if you've come across a, a way to kind of provide a, a link an argumentation, sort of like a, a reminder of like the early Christian fathers with their apologies to connect to heretics, in terms of providing that link that would sort of put, bring them back to a point of discourse and get them through this whole need to see us as bigots in order to win the argument type of situation. Yeah, um, it's, a really, it's a really great question, and I, I think probably different people would handle that differently because they're gonna come from a different, different people come from different sets of backgrounds uh, even disciplinary backgrounds. Since my own background is philosophy, I, I might invite someone in that situation to, to tell me whether they think Mahatma Gandhi was a bigot. Mahatma Gandhi was a, he was more conservative than I am on issues of sex and marriage. Right? He, uh, he, he wrote a book against contraception, a small book against contraception. He was very suspicious of to say the least, of the modern, modern ideas about sexual uh, liberty or sexual uh, liberation. So we might begin there. I mean, was he, was he a bigot? Um, you know, was uh, Immanuel Kant a bigot? Was Plato a bigot? How about Aristotle? Xenophanes? How about Plutarch? Were they, all, were they all bigots? And by the way, this view you hold about sexuality, who do you point to as kind of the founding fathers and mothers of your tradition. Where, what's, where are the roots of the, if the roots of my ideas are in Plato and Aristotle, Musonius and Xenophanes, Plutarch, St. Augustine, the Bible, Aquinas, Kant, Anscombe, Gandhi, where are the roots of yours? <laughs> Now, what, uh, and, and then, and, the, the, and my, my friend Brian Zach will, will catch the unfairness in what I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, or I should say tendentiousness, Brian, not unfairness. Uh, and I would say, now, I, I do know of some uh, kind of founding figures in your tradition. There was one named Margaret Sanger. Now, we were talking about bigots, right? <laughs> Sanger promoted her message at meetings of the, no, let's see, it wasn't MBA. No, KKK, that's what it was. <laughs> Kinsey, let's talk about Kinsey, Alfred Kinsey. Yeah, Bo, what was your hand up or next to you? Yeah. Uh, Luke Foster from Columbia. Um, in talking about taking the long view and how things that seem inevitable do change, you mentioned, of course, that the majority of this generation is pro-life, or would use that label. But surely a large part of that is that abortion has a very obvious set of victims. Right? The, the, there are tangible, visceral harms to particular people. And, and, it, and in the age of, of sonograms, that's very easy to see. Now, I think clearly, as we all know, the redefinition of marriage also has victims, but it's much less tangible. How can we make that case, make it visible in the public square? Yeah. Things are not on all fours. That's absolutely right. They're not exactly alike. And it could very well be that this is going to be a harder case to make than the pro-life case for the very reason that you articulate. But let's not... Um, exaggerate that difference. People knew what an actual abortion, say at 18 weeks or 20 weeks, looked like in 1973. People weren't under any illusions about that. 
they knew that you have to hack off the arms and hack off the leg. You know, they knew exactly. It was, <coughs> it was visible. Now, it is true, I think, that the sonogram, so that sonography has been a great asset to the uh, pro-life movement because <coughs> just about everybody has it. When you have baby now, you have son sonography. And you can tell what the sex is very often. And, you know, you end up naming the baby before the baby. So that's little Sally or that's, I mean, I, you know, when I go to dinner parties at my uh, colleagues' homes, so I'm getting to the age now, it used to be kids, but now it's grandchildren. And, I, you know, you walk into the kitchen and you drop your bottle of wine off on the kitchen counter and you look on the refrigerator and there are the pictures are up on the refrigerator and, and you see this not so grainy anymore image of this little unborn baby. And I'll say, well, who is that? And, and you know, proudly uh, the grandmother or grandfather will say, oh, well, you know, that's Harriet. That's our first granddaughter. Granddaughter. Now she hasn't been born yet and won't be born for some weeks, right? But that's, so you're right. I mean, it, it's brought it home uh, uh, to people. But it's amazing how in that early period, the juggernaut period of the 70s and 80s, how even the images of abortions themselves and the knowledge of, which was at that, even at that point pretty advanced. I mean, this is not a state of ignorance in 1973 <laughs> about what you got there. Nobody thought it was a potato. Um, <clears throat> uh, despite that, people were able in the zeal, in the kind of ideological zeal of the thing, to just lay that aside, just can't, you know, avert your view, avert your vision, just don't look. Just pretend it's not there. Um, so I, I don't think you can, uh, you, you, I think we need to avoid suggesting that it was much easier for the pro-life movement to survive in those days because of the kind of visceral reaction to abortion when people saw it. People knew and a lot of people in the ideological zeal just didn't have the uh, reaction. Now, I do think it'll be very interesting to see what happens sociologically. We don't have enough data yet, but we will start to get data, like the data we now have about the consequences of 40 years of divorce culture, or now 50 years of divorce culture and no-fault divorce and so forth and so on. That was another juggernaut. I mean, everybody thought, oh, no-fault no divorce, just a great idea. And uh, divorce should not be stigmatized. Divorce is a, not a bad thing. You know, it's unfortunate that people need to be divorced, but actually divorce is not a bad thing. And it's even good, it's better for the spouses, it's better for the kids, it's better for society. You know, the kids don't have to squabble, don't have to uh, listen to the parents squabbling all the time. You know, the courts aren't enmeshed in these horrible, emotional, uh, terrible situations, spending public resources and so forth. No fault divorce just seemed like it was a wonderful idea. It's a great idea. And same for, you know, alternative family forms, non-marital, uh, uh, childbearing, and so forth. And then 40 years of data, 50 years of data come in, and liberal, uh, mainstream, academic sociologists like uh, Isabel Sawhill at the Brookings Institution will publish an article entitled, Dan Quayle Was Right. Uh, now, you're probably too young to remember Dan Quayle. He was the Vice President of the United States under the first President Bush, who got himself into an enormous amount of trouble by criticizing a uh, television uh, uh, character who had a baby without having a husband. She was a middle-aged, successful uh, woman. I think she was, uh, you know, what was she? She was like a, a newsreader or something like that. Yeah, was, if I have it right? And, and, and she, Murphy Brown was her name. And, uh, and Quayle, in a speech, said, look, you know, it, this, this is glamorizing out of wedlock childbearing is not a good idea because this is a curse in our society. It had dreadful consequences for children, especially in poorer and more vulnerable sectors of the, uh, of the community. Well, quail was just vilified. I mean, they, the elite didn't like quail anyway, and they thought he was an adult, and, you know, they were really hostile to him. So, they went after him and just held him up to ridicule about this Murphy Brown thing. And then, you know, here we are, 2014, I think it was actually last year, 2013, you got a woman at the, Bro very respected sociologist at the Brookings Institution writing a, a, an article entitled, Dan Quayle Was Right, about the consequences of this stuff. So we'll have to see, uh, you know, 
what happens when the data comes in. There are going to be more and more kids who have been raised in same-sex headed households. We'll see how they do. We'll see the testimony they give uh, about, their own, uh, about their own lives. Uh, I'm sure it'll be mixed. Um, you know, we'll, we'll begin to see if some of the consequences that people like me fear uh, for the general culture, the general marriage culture, um, the uh, growing acceptance of still other uh, deviations from traditional norms like polyamory, uh, the German, uh, German Ethics Council a couple of weeks ago uh, recommended that Germany repeal its uh, adult brother, sister, and uh, parent-child incest laws. You know, that, that just doesn't come out of nowhere. I mean, it's just part of this whole cultural uh, uh, movement. So uh, it'll be a while before we have the kind of data, I think, that would be in some ways analogous to the data that we have, say, for divorce or non-marital cohabitation and childbearing and so forth. There's uh, someone right in front of you there. I heard someone say recently that um, the same-sex attraction culture or individuals that are seeking to be married um, and going to businesses and looking for you know, floral arrangements or photography services are banking on um, what we've adapted as our, in our culture as, I'm trying to think of how they exactly worded it, as being non-discriminatory in all senses. So businesses can't discriminate you know, who they hire. They have to hire men and women. They can't discriminate against religion. They can't discriminate all these things. And now if someone comes and they have same-sex attraction and they want your floral services for their wedding reception or their marriage ceremony and you're not providing it, it's seen as being equally, you know, how are, how are you justifying that it's okay to discriminate in this situation, but you're saying it's not okay to discriminate if me as the, the you know, head of my small business, I don't want to hire women because they might get pregnant and then they're going to be absent for a few months and that's going to be a drain on my business. But you said that I don't have the right to not hire women. So it just doesn't seem like there's equal, equal rights for, for that. Does that make sense? I, I'm not quite sure I understand it. Let me take a shot at it, and if I haven't answered the question, you pull me back and make me, just re-articulate it and make me answer it. Um, I, I, I touched on it obliquely in responding, I think, to, to Ryan. Um, the question for the florist is not, uh, can I refuse to sell flowers to people who self-identify as gay or, or same-sex attracted or, you know, or, or in a thruple or, or anything like that. It is, will I participate in the ceremony? Can I be forced to participate in the ceremony? So the same florist that had been selling flowers to this customer for years, fully knowing about this customer's self-identification and this customer's belief and, and so forth. And the customer knowing all about the Christian faith of the, of the florist shop owners. Everybody knew everything about each other in this. The, um, the issue was not, can I refuse to sell flowers or even refuse to hire the guy if he wanted a job in the shop? The question was, can I be forced to facilitate or play a role in the ceremony? Same for the photographer. You know, uh, can... Uh, can I, uh, uh, can I say, look, if you want a portrait shot, I'll give you a portrait shot. But I'm not going to photograph the wedding because I'm not going to contribute my artistic skill. I don't do that any more than a speechwriter who believes in the philosophy of the Democratic Party is going to agree or should be compelled if he doesn't agree to write a speech for the Republican uh, Party. So I think that is the key distinction. Now, there are other circumstances in which institutions in particular, religiously based institutions or conviction based institutions, have in my judgment a right to hire on the basis of, or a right to refuse to hire on the basis of conduct. Conduct. So, uh, if, um, if it's the Unitarian Church, 
Unitarian Church. And they're looking for a minister. They're looking even for an organist or a, uh, a choral director or something like that. Uh, and they don't want to hire me because of my political activities. They should have a right not to hire me because of my political activities. They probably shouldn't have a right not to hire me because I have brown hair or because I wear glasses. But my activities represent a different issue, and especially in the context of, of faith. I mean, if for the Unitarians this is a matter of faith that you ought not to, uh, to you know, advance moral conservative causes or, or, or whatever, then I think that's even an additional reason not to push me, not to force me on them. And the same would be true, say, for uh, an LDS or an Orthodox Jewish uh, or Muslim or Catholic school that was uh, considering hiring uh, a person who um, went to um, pornographic movies. You know, publicly made, you know, said, look, I, you know, my, my preferred form of entertainment is, is to go to XXX movies. And that, <laughs> they probably don't want that person working for them. And I think they've got every right to say, well, look, if that's the, kind of, if that's the way you lead your life, we're an institution that's devoted to a different story. We want our students uh, to be taught by people who basically hold our uh, convictions. That seems to me very different from discriminating on the basis of hair color or race or you know, sex or anything like that. One last question back there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you briefly explain what the sexual orientation and gender identification laws are and why they are problematic? Yeah. Uh, they're, they're simply laws that forbid discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. And there are a couple of reasons why they're really problematic. One is sexual orientation and gender identity, but particularly sexual orientation, is not a, uh, uh, a clear category. It's an ambiguous and in some ways equivocal category. I remember when I was an expert for the state in the Colorado Amendment 2 case, Romer against Evans, in um, 1992 or 1993. It was about the sexual orientation provisions of Boulder and Denver, Colorado municipal uh, anti-discrimination ordinances, which had been overturned by a state constitutional amendment. So there, one of the questions was, well, what do we mean by sexual orientation? And some people said, well, we mean feelings or attractions, inner phenomena, uh, phenomena. Uh, desires. Other people said, well, it means not simply the desires or inclinations or attractions, but one's acting on those attractions or desires or feelings. And, and the, the party that was you know, uh, attacking the constitutional amendment, the parties, plural, that were attacking the constitutional amendment, we're very careful never to actually resolve that issue, to never take a clear stand on that issue. So it's not clear what you're buying. I think at this point it's clear that if you buy into a sexual orientation or gender identity law, you, what, you're, what you're getting is a restriction on any discrimination, not only based on inward desires, or feelings or attractions, but also the outward behavior that expresses those, uh, those desires. Gender identity is the same thing. I mean, it's, it's uh, the question of, of uh, uh, whether you are a man or a woman. And obviously, they're the, the same movement that gives us the idea of same-sex marriage gives us the idea that you're being a man or a woman is not a matter of biology or even genetics, but is, is a matter of, of um, your self-chosen identity or the internal feelings or sense of your gender. So your biological sex is one thing, but your gender might or might not line up with that. Uh, for reasons that uh, are going to be laid out very well in a new book that will be published soon by 
uh, Dr. Aaron Cariotti of the University of, uh, of uh, California Irvine Medical School and Dr. Paul McHugh, the uh, former chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University. I think that whole concept of gender identity is highly problematic. Uh, and so I, I think we are going down exactly the wrong road in uh, embracing the very idea, much less making law around it. Is that, uh, are you calling this to a close, uh, Melissa? Yeah, We're good. Exactly calling it to a close. But thank you again. Thank Please you. Join me in another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.